So we're diving into some Patreon questions here with Matt Manzari. First one from Bobby Sutherland, commissioner of the PWL. He's wondering when he's going to see you at a, a PWL event. Dude, I would love to go to a PWL event. Actually, I was planning on going to as many PWLs last year as I could, and every one of them ended up when I had a speaking gig. Yeah. So I'm like, it's really hard to like walk away from kind of my job, especially now that I'm doing it less, <laughs> to go pay to go to an event when got to put food on the table. Yeah. So. I, I would love to go to PWL. I think it'd be super fun. And I always say I'm retired competitively, but I'd probably ride in a PWL. Like, there we go. Like, and he was even saying, he's like, you don't even have to come ride, dude. Just come hang out. Like, I would come hang out, but I'd also come ride. And I'm old. I'm washed up. So I'd be happy to get lost if I get lost. That's cool. But I want to go hit some of these setups. They look They're really like fun. Really fun. You should, uh, maybe we can convince Reed to roll with you. You guys can yeah, kind of like I'll try to drag him there. along. Yeah, exactly. Um, got one from Joshua Boyle. And he's wondering who would play you in a movie about your life. And it's then funny, he, back in the day, like in the Transformer days, and when I had my hair like super curly and was young, I used to get Shia LaBeouf a lot that people would say like young Shia LaBeouf and young me looked pretty similar. So I don't know, maybe Shia LaBeouf. That'd be a good one. He says he thinks it would be Barry Kogan. I have no idea who that is. Who's Barry Kogan? I don't know. I don't know. He must look like you though. Probably. Or he's a great actor. Who knows? Uh, we got one from Jeff McKee. He's saying, in your latest chapter on the water, you seem to have made a smooth transition into wakeboard or wake surfing. What brought you about that change, and when does foil come into play for you, or has it already? Kind of answer yes. that, though. Yes, so I, I didn't mention them, but SPG, Signature Performance Foils, they've, they're like an unofficial sponsor. They, they hooked me up with foils. Um, I really like their stuff. I was on Armstrong stuff for a while. So the transition into wake surfing is actually when Reed started, when he was trying to do wake surfing. Yeah. <laughs> And he's like, I'm doing this thing. It's wake surfing. I'm like, fine, I'll try it. And then I was super frustrated because as a wake skater, I'm like, it'll be easy. I just do all my tricks. And no, it took me a whole summer to like do shove it. Because everything you do in wake skating, you land on your back foot and leave on your back foot because you lean on the rope. Yeah. And then everything in wake surfing is front foot. So it's like, I would go out and like do a shove it and sink it in the water. And I could not keep the wave. I couldn't land anything and keep the wave. And so that transition happened after my accident. And then it just started getting fun once the trick started to click. So that was my transition into wake surfing. And, um, and then, and really when you start riding finless, it gets super fun. Cause then it's just like skating. Yeah. Um, and then foiling was, foiling was, I was at an operation wake surf event and Robbie had a slingshot foil. I was like, I want to try that. It's like, gosh, this thing's so hard. And then we realized we put the tail on backwards. We had, we had it set up wrong. I'm like, how does anybody stand up on this? And then we got it set up right. And then I just started doing it. And then, I mean, foiling is, that's the biggest rabbit hole. Cause you're just like, cool, I got a foil. Oh wow, this is too heavy. I want to pump. Oh, I need a bigger mass. Oh, I need a different wing. I need a different tail wing. Oh, well this wing's good for pumping, but it's so stable. You can't really carve. If I want to carve, I need a smaller wing. If I want to pump, I need a wider wing. If I want to do errors, I need this. So I'm in that foil world right now. Yeah, it's definitely, you can get, you can get some tech in the and, foil And I game. just had a custom board built. My friend shapes surfboards and he just made his first foil for me. And I ha I don't like most board designs on foils. And I, I, I'm not going to go down that road, but I have a lot of reasons why that it just seems obvious. Like you either have like, like phase five made this board that's pretty long, but pretty narrow. I'm like, there's not enough stability in that board to paddle in and use it as an ocean foil, but it's not short enough and movement. It's got too much swing, swing weight to just use as a boat board. So I'm like, it should be wider and shorter. So like I, I had a board made that's pretty short. So it has little swing weight, but it's really thick. So it's got a lot of leaders so you could paddle it in. Also, you need tech to be able to get it off the water. Cause if you're like ocean foiling, the corn, the edges, the bottom edges of the board will create suction if it hits the water and then it kind of kills your pump. So like in order to hit the water and then come off, like you need to think about the water as that suction is as efficient and resistant as possible. So it doesn't create like a suction cup. And so there's a bunch of foil stuff that I'm down that journey, Jeff. And I know you're down that journey. Jeff is in deep. He's, he's, he's pumping deep. in the backyard. dude. I would love to go foil with you, Jeff, like come out to Claremont or tell me where to go. I'll come foil with you. Yeah. How about you come down to Florida, jump on the podcast and then hit some waves and foil with uh, with Matt. Yeah. There we go. Uh, we got a, this is a pretty long one from Bill Porter, but I think it's a, 
you know, he's, he always asks pretty good questions. So, or really good questions, I would say. Um, as a boat dealer now selling elite high-end wake surf boats, uh, boats, as well as an athlete, dad, and husband, what is your outlook on the escalating price of boats? And what do you think the industry can slash will do to find a way to make boats more affordable for that middle class? Um, and he's got a second part, but. So I agree. Like I had this question yesterday. Somebody was like, oh, is there just so much more profit? And I was like, I don't think so. Like personally, and I could be wrong. I don't know the numbers from the manufacturer, but they're like, how did boats double in price? And I'm like, well, think of like an 08 wake setter. Like that boat weighed like 3,500 pounds. It had a small block 350 in it. It had no tech for like tabs and stuff. It was just ballast pumps, maybe a screen. It's just weight and and you didn't need that much power. Now the boats are twice as deep hull to create a wave. So you're using twice the fiberglass material. You got to get twice the horsepower. So you're using more expensive engines. You got way more technology with all surf tabs and angles and electronics and so everything has, I think, more than doubled. If you put an 08 boat next to a 2024, it's twice the weight, twice the size, twice the material, twice the stuff. So when you're like, oh, wow, boats went from 100,000 to 200,000, that seems insane. It's like, it is insane, but they did do a lot more. What I think the industry's done, and I don't think this is a great answer, but they've stretched loans out further. You used to finance a boat for like 10 years. Now you can finance 20 to 30 years. So it's like people come in and, there are cash buyers, there's rich people, there's always been rich people, but there's a lot of people that are middle class that are like, hey, I want a bow, I need my payment $1,000 a month or something like that, that they can, whatever's doable for them and whether you're putting them in something used or new, like how do you get to their budget and make it work? But the other thing I tell people is, um, you know, part of what I loved about wake skating, so one thing, I don't know if you followed numbers, but like wake skate sales, were one of the only things in the wake industry that grew in 08. Um, wakeboard numbers went down, boat sales went down, everything went down, wake skate sales grew. And I think it's because, for one, winching stuff was big at that time, but even back then, wakeboarding was looked at as the rich side of the sport because it was like, if you wanted a wakeboard, there weren't that many cable parks back then, so it was like, if you want a wakeboard, you need this boat that's expensive, and then you need all the ballast in the boat, which makes the fuel more expensive. You need this board that's like six or $800, Whereas you could go buy a wastegate back then for like two to four hundred dollars, depending on pro model versus beginner. And if your grandpa had like a bass tracker with a 30 on it, you could have a blast and get super technical or build a flat bar. You get a winch for a thousand bucks and ride for a dollar of gas all day on spillways. And so I like that it made it approachable. So I when I look at the sport now, um, another reason to plug West Rock is Dan's approach to cable. Like cable, in my mind, should be an alternative to people that don't have the money for a boat. But what we've done is we've created cables that are only for people that have boats too. You go to OWC and there's going to be a lot of kids. Most of those kids have boats. Um, And not to knock OWC, it's like any cable, pretty much. Um, But I look at what Dan did with West Rock. Like he took a lot of creative approaches to that cable park to keep prices down. He created you know, programs where if you're a local and that zip code, you can get a way, way discounted season pass. So, you know, to really look at it kind of in that European view, like this is an alternative to skateboarding and how can we create a way for kids to do this? Um, I think another thing is riders calling out riders. Like, are we taking people out? Like I'll call you guys out. Cause I, I asked myself that I, you know, when I see some of these top competitive wakeboarders that live on my lake, and I'm not going to list names, but you know who you are, that you go out and you do your set and you go in and you go out and do your set and you do your contest run every day or a couple times a day. I'm like, that's cool. But how many people bought a boat because they saw you ride by a thousand feet away? Or how many people bought a boat because you stood in first place on that podium? Like, go to the local skate park and be like, hey, dude. You want to learn to wake skate? What's that? It's like skateboarding on the water. Let's go have fun or let's go surf today. Like it's a million degrees out. Cool. Like most of the time those kids are down. Um, so I, I think like it doesn't have to be just dropping boat prices, but find friends with boats, build communities, build. There's some shared models now where like on our lake, there's a, a boat club. You can pay a monthly subscription and they have like 10 boats. And let's say it's like 500 bucks a month and they got like four pontoons, a couple axis and whatever, like, and if a boat's available, you can use it. You pay that subscription, you just put gas in it. 
Um, I think we need more stuff like that. I think that's sick. Yeah. Um, I think that's really cool. Cause there is no way around like the boats cost kind of what the boats cost. If there's room for the manufacturers to drop the price, I think that's great. Stretching out financing. If people want to commit to that kind of thing. Great. Um, but then also from the dealer aspect, it's like, where's your price point? Um, where's your profit margin as a dealer? I, I got, I got called by another Centurion dealer and they're like, how are you getting your prices there? Like, dude, you're killing me. And it's like, you know, we try to just sell to our territory and, you know, I'm not looking to steal sales from people around the country, but I'd say I'm probably the cheapest Centurion dealer in, in the world, maybe definitely the country. But part of what I do is be really be conscious about how big my team is. You know, I'm like, yeah, it's cool. You're a huge dealership, but if you're a dealership with $30,000 a month rent and 40, 50 employees, your overhead's so high. You got to make way more on a boat than I do. When I run a skeleton crew, I run an outboard tech and inboard tech, a uh, really good manager, a couple of kids that kind of can run around, help me um, on day to day stuff. And I keep my costs as low as I possibly can just so I can sell you a boat and get your family to boat for as cheap as possible. Like, you know, I'm, I'm make my money in other ways right now. So like I committed two years, no salary from the dealer. So I don't make I think anything from the dealer personally right now. And neither does my partner in Salt Lake. Um, and what we're trying to do is we're like, we want to help this community. I'd love to do a kid's event one day and put more money into it than anyone else has. Like give, give prize money for kids. Give like, I want to help kids out. I want to help people get in the water. And that's really what it, what it always starts and ends for me. So Bill, that's a great question. And I'm, I know I'm talking through a lot of different things on it, but I agree with you. It's, it's a hard question. I think there's, there's still like kids. You can get out there, get a wake skate, bring back wake skating, get, get a jet ski. You can get a nineties jet ski and go wake skate and have fun. Um, and on, on the surf side, I mean, we knock surfing a lot, but I also think about our industry is kind of what it is right now because of surfing. Like there's no way around that, that. 30 this I heard a stat that said 39 out of 40 boats sold are to people that only want to wake surf and it's like so wakeboarding's cool and it's core wake skating kind of doesn't exist anymore it kind of does it's kind of like it's our thing and we love it and I hope it gets huge and cable has helped wake skating stay through and through but like boat wake skating's kind of kind of dead um so I have to thank surfing in this fact that I think a lot of the money that comes into our industry for people to make boards and these companies, most of their sales are surfboards. Most of their sales are surf products. So, you know, I'm thankful we do have wealthy people in our industry that want to buy surf boats. Um, so people like you and I that maybe just want to go rip around the cable or do some inside out tricks on a jet ski can do, can yeah. do that. And boards can keep getting made. <laughs> yeah, I agree. And you know, there's a whole thing on that surfing topic, but I've always thought like, you know, if people are getting on the water and in a life jacket and well, serving may not be my thing and it may not be what I, you know, like to watch or whatever. Well, they can take the next step. The wakeboard will be on the yeah. boat. The wake surf will be on the boat. The foil will be on the boat. Like the, I think they'll all be on the boat in the future. That's at least how I see it, you know? Yeah. So, and then maybe they say, Hey, what's that wakeboarding thing? That looks really cool. Or what's that wake skating thing? That mm -hmm. looks really cool. So you just kind of move on and shift around and find the, the stuff that you like to do. But yeah, Bill, that was, that was a great question. Um, we got a last one from a guy you mentioned earlier, Josh Dahlheimer. Mm -hmm. I said that right, right? Yep. Dahlheimer. Um, has anyone ever randomly crashed at your house and you help them or their family um, get back home <laughs> while being stuck in Florida? Wow, Josh, that's a really specific question. <laughs> it's a very specific question. Um, no, I don't know. I try to live, I guess, pretty open-handed. Um, but part of that's because I'm so thankful some of people have helped us along the way. Like I always, I look at our house, I look at our, you know, stuff, whatever. And I'm always like, I didn't do this. I'm not smart enough or good enough to end up here on like front home. Like, that's not me. That's just, you know, I think I look at it as like God's provision and other people helping me and all this stuff. So, um, yeah, we have people that come over every day. Um, we got people at our house right now from Texas. We got Dan coming over right after you and I are done to come hang out. And I'm always like, you know, Rusty's boat was at my house the last month and I wasn't there. And I was just like, yeah, dude, use a slip. Cool. But like, I try to live in that way where it's just like, I'm super thankful people help me get here. And I want to help them. But Josh was in town. His flight got canceled and he was like, I don't know what we're going to do. And I was like, we'll just come stay at the house. And he's like, well, I got the whole family. I'm like, cool. Yeah. Come stay. And then his next flight got canceled because there's big winter storms in his area. And he's like, I gotta get back for work. He's like, I'm gonna go rent a car right now. I'm like, no, 
Like Orlando is the opposite way of, you know, we're in Claremont. So you're going to have to take the turnpike to Orlando, go to the airport, get a rental car to then drive back and pass my house. You'll be like two hours by the time you do that and get back to here. It'll be like one in the morning and then you're going to drive all night and try to work. It's like, just get my truck and drive to Ohio. He's like, I can't take your truck. I'm like, yeah, take it. I don't care. And I'm like, I got my little car that I run around and get good fuel mileage in. So I have like a little salvage title uh, Honda or GTI at the time that I just was like, yeah, I got this thing. So he took my truck to Ohio and he was coming back for the wake well conference, like at the end of the month. And I'm like, I'll just borrow Reed's truck or like somebody I'll find a truck. If I need to pull a boat out of like somebody will do a favor for me. So I let him take my brand new Duramax up to Ohio. Oh, brand new. Okay. <laughs> As like a 2021 or 2022 Duramax. So yeah, you'd have it. And he thought that was a big deal. What I'm like, dude, people have helped my wife and I in so many ways. Like just, I don't know. And life's more fun. Yeah. Yeah, Life's more fun that way. Like, yeah. People that play that whole, like it's a doggy dog world. You got to protect you, you and your own and watch out for number one. I'm like, that's an exhaustive, terrible way to live your life. Like I'd rather just try to be more fun and open and share everything. And yeah, you get taken advantage of once in a while by people. And then you're like, okay, but yeah. And in the long run, it's going to work out. And in, in the end, even if you lose more than you gain, it's still worth it because you lived a life where you had peace and contentment and joy. hundred percent. I agree so. with that for sure. Wow. Great. Great question there, Josh. Uh, yeah. So that's, that's all the Patreon questions I got. Um, thanks everyone for tuning in. Thanks for staying, staying after to answer those Patreon questions. Uh, if you guys are interested in uh, supporting the podcast, Patreon is the best way to do that. Hit the link in the description. You guys can see who the guests are early and submit questions for them. So thanks everyone for tuning in. See you guys next time. Thanks Hunter. See you guys next time.